I was, I was very fortunate. I was working on my uh, graduate thesis on the topic of how the physics inside of a transistor affects its behavior in a circuit when you use it as a switch, like in a switching power supply or in a logic circuit, something like that. <coughs> and um, it turned out there were lots of papers, equations ad nauseum, analyzing how these transistors worked when you used them in amplifier circuits like your hi-fi. But nobody had looked carefully at what happened when you used them as a switch. And of course, in today's world, that's what most transistors do. In those days, it was not so clear. But it was a very interesting thing to look at. So I was in the middle of that. And deep in this boundary between the physics of inside the transistor and the circuit and how it behaved and what you might do with it. So uh, I was just finishing up my thesis when there appeared a paper by a Japanese researcher uh, by the name of Leo Asaki. And he had invented a device that worked by electron tunneling. Now, electron tunneling is a quantum phenomenon. It's uh, one of the very basic properties of an electron that it behaves like a wave when you get close enough up to it. And electron tunneling allows an electron to penetrate through a barrier that it couldn't normally get through but it can tunnel through if the barrier gets thin enough. And so that was a very interesting thing to me. I had heard about tunneling in physics courses, but the examples were always kind of things like radioactive decay. Well, radioactive decay is interesting, but you can't do anything with it. You can't change it. You can't change the barrier. You can't it just, you observe it and it's done. But here was an electron device that actually did useful work and it worked on this principle. So I got fascinated by this quantum phenomenon, electron tunneling, and it ended up, I spent the next 12 years of my life working on it. Um, well, that was, it was interesting. And I got the graduate students involved, and we did a lot of work on tunneling through thin insulating films, tunneling in junctions between metals and semiconductors, all of those kinds of things. And in the process, we had to learn a lot about how to measure the energy of the barriers that the electron was tunneling through, and there was a lot of, of uh, just basic experimental work that was going on. Well, I was just getting started with that, and one day this guy walked into my office and said, hi, I'm Gordon Moore from Fairchild. Well, I, did, I had heard of Fairchild, of course, because they were making some of the leading edge transistors, but I'd never heard of Gordon Moore, but uh, he says, what are you doing? So I told him a little about the work on tunneling, and, and he said, you're teaching the transistor course, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, do you have a lab with that course? And I said, yes, of course. I, I wouldn't teach a course like that without a lab. So he said, would you like some transistors to use in your course? Well, that was, <laughs> the answer to that was pretty obvious. Uh, in those days, um, the, um, the transistors we could buy cost a dollar which is a lot of money for a grad student. And they were very poor transistors. They didn't work very well. And here were these high performance transistors that he offered me a big bag of. So well, that got my attention right away. And so we talked some more about what I was doing. And he said, um, why don't you come up and give a, 
give a seminar at, at Fairchild. And so uh, that was very exciting for me because I knew they were doing leading edge work in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, this was around 1960 that this happened. So uh, I went up and gave my talk and went out to dinner with a few of the Fairchild founders. And, and uh, they said, would you like to consult with us? And once again, I didn't have to think twice. I said, sure. And that began a weekly commute up to Silicon Valley from, from Pasadena, where I was teaching. And it was a very interesting experience because here were a bunch of really smart people that were uh, grappling with very real problems of producing large quantities of these leading edge transistors. Uh, they had a production process that had never been done before. They were uh, fighting all kinds of problems with the, the basic nature of the transistors. And the thing I found right away was that any time you have a leading edge technology you're pushing, you will uncover fundamental questions that there aren't answers to in the literature. When you first look at the literature, it looks overwhelming. It looks like everything has been done and everything that needed to be known is already known. And it turns out that's only an illusion. When you get right down to doing a real thing, it simply isn't understood. No matter how many papers there are and how many equations they heap on it, they don't know what's really going on and you have to figure it out. So I would come up with these really neat fundamental problems by working with the guys up at Fairchild and go back and work with my grad students and do the fundamental physics. And that ended up being an extraordinarily productive 10 years or so. And um, Gordon Moore is a wonderful human being, and uh, he's an early riser like I am. So he would get to the Fairchild Lab about 7 o'clock. And so on my consulting day, I would come in about 7, and we would have an hour before anybody else showed up to, to talk about what was going on and things he'd like me to look at. And, and I remember very vividly in uh, 1964 or so, he had been making this plot. The, the, um, they had built the first integrated circuit in 1959. Bob Noyce, uh, co-founder with, with Gordon, had uh, figured out how to use the, the process they already had for making transistors and hook the transistors together on the surface of the piece of silicon and make a working circuit all on one piece of silicon. Whereas before they have to cut the transistors up and put them in packages and wire them up and then put them back on a circuit board to make a circuit. So there's a huge uh, economy if you could make the circuit right on the silicon. And Bob was the guy who had figured that out. And Gordon had observed that as they developed the technology, about every year, the number of transistors they could put on one of these circuits would double. And just in the natural course of people figuring out the kind of circuits they wanted to build and, and designing them and getting them to work, and this was a thing that had gone on for, for five or six years by then. And uh, he'd been making this plot. And then every once in a while, I'd say, Gordon, could I have a slide of that so I could show it to people? And when I'd go around and, and give talks, I would always show Gordon Moore's plot. And, and one day, we were sitting there. And he said, Carver, you're working on electron tunneling. Now, that happens when things get very small, right? I said, yeah, that's right. 
he said, well, won't that limit how small you could make a transistor? And I said, well, yes, of course it will. And he said, well, how small is that? So I stopped and thought about it. And I said, well, if you're making MOS transistors, when the gate oxide gets thinner than about 100 angstroms, 10 nanometers, then you'll start to get gate currents. And if you get too much gate current, it won't be an amplifier anymore. But that's, that's a long way from the size transistors we're making right now. I said, let me, let me go work with one of my grad students, and we'll figure out exactly how that's going to work. So that got me thinking. It was an excellent question, of course. And um, so I, a couple of years later, I got invited to give a talk at a IEEE workshop. Uh, every year, they had these workshops for people working on device physics. And um, in, in those days, it was a small club. There were maybe 100 of us in the US that worked on that stuff. We all pretty much knew each other. And we'd get together once a year at these workshops and talk about the latest things we'd done. And it was great fun. And so they wanted me to talk at this, this workshop. And I, I thought I would talk about what I'd been thinking about scaling the, the circuits better. And the more I worked on it, we knew a lot about the fundamental physics of the transistors by then. And it turned out if you, if you scaled them down smaller and smaller, something very interesting happened. Now, there were papers all throughout the literature saying that if you made them much smaller than they were at that time, that the power would get so big that it would melt the silicon, or the cosmic rays would get you, or one thing and another. But there was nothing that I could find in the fundamental physics that would stop us until they got maybe a factor of 20 or 40 or maybe even 100 smaller than they were at that time in linear dimensions, which means there would be 10,000 times as many per unit area. And something very amazing happened. If you scaled it just right, you scaled things horizontally, of course, so you could put more on the chip. But you had to scale it vertically, because otherwise the device wouldn't work. And then because you scaled it vertically, you had to keep the electric fields from getting too high, so you had to cut, cut the voltage down. And if you did all that just right, it turned out you not only got more transistors, they all worked faster. And they took enough less power that the power per unit area stayed constant. So there was nothing to stop you until you ran into the basic physics. And it was astounding how much faster they got. Well, I, I kept saying, look, this can't be true. Murphy always ha has a way to stop you on stuff like this. But I couldn't find it. So I gave the talk. And of course, everybody was yelling and shouting. I didn't know what I was talking about. I had forgotten about this and that and the other and uh, all of that. But uh, in the end, uh, by a year later, we had another workshop. And two or three groups had gone and done the calculations themselves. And, corrected some little factors that I had so that they could add value. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and that then was the first time that we had a scientific basis for the belief that Gordon Moore's vision of having ever more transistors on a chip 
could actually be realized with physical transistors. And so that then created a belief system that caused the industry to adopt a process of continued scaling, which they're still on today. And the whole thing became known as Moore's Law. And the information technology that we all enjoy today is uh, benefited tremendously from that, from that phenomenon. So that was an example of where some very basic physics applied to a very real problem in a very real industry that was pushing the edge made a big difference. And um, to me, that was a great experience, of course, to be able to participate with the guys that were actually doing the work of building those transistors and designing those integrated circuits. And, and um, it, 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 was, it was really a great, great experience. So I wish I could report to you that our technical progress in not only the information technology but other technologies worked that way. <laughs> but I have to tell you another story that happened to a friend of mine Charlie Towns, who unfortunately is not with us anymore, but Charlie's the guy that invented the stimulated emission devices, lasers and masers, that we all enjoy in our communication systems and in our DVD players and all of, all of technology, is the pointers we point at the screen with, all of those things. And. Um, Charlie came up with this idea shortly after he got his PhD. And um, he had guts enough to go talk to Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg, who were the two founders of quantum mechanics, the same quantum mechanics that we torture our students with today. <laughs> and unfortunately it hasn't changed much. And so Charlie went to them, each separately, and described his idea for making coherent radiation by making a stimulated emission device. And each of them separately had said to Charlie, oh, Sonny, you just don't understand how quantum mechanics works. <laughs> and of course, the reason they said that was because they had conceptualized the quanta of light as being little bullets of light that came out of an atom and hit another atom. And if that's the way it worked, you could never make a laser work. And if you did get a laser that worked, it would never be capable of cooling down atoms to the point where they make a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is the way atoms are cooled today to make those nano-Kelvin temperatures that make the Bose condensate work. Uh, I mean, you all know that when it rains heavier, the sound on the roof doesn't get quieter. Well, if the photons were little bullets, the more of them you had, the more noise you'd get. Doesn't work that way. So it wasn't Charlie that didn't understand how quantum systems worked. It was the guy who had ginned up the hokey kind of theory that they'd come up with which gave the right answers when you had a statistical kind of thing like a glowing gas, but was totally incapable of coping with systems like lasers. 
Well, fortunately, Charlie was not easily dissuaded, so he went back and kept working and got his maser to work. And he and his collaborators uh, were hard at work on on getting an optical version of the laser when uh, Ted Maiman down at Hughes Research Lab actually went and created one. And uh, that's all history now. We all have lasers and think nothing of them. But here were the scientifically best respected people in the field actively dissuading this young man from building a historic device that's absolutely key to our information technology today. That's the flip side of how, quote, fundamental science, when it's not coupled closely to the real world, can actually retard progress. So both things happen. Both things are happening today. Uh, fortunately, those of us who were working with quantum systems had to figure out our own way of thinking about them because the standard way that Bohr and Heisenberg and the people after them had formulated the thing didn't work for what we were trying to do. We all had to sort of hack it together our own way. We're still having to do that. Uh, and it's a good thing we have people out there building real communication systems, building real optical systems. Many of you know that today we can basically do all of the coherent processing that you do in radio at optical frequencies. It's absolutely astounding and there are no little bullets of light to get in the way, fortunately. So that's, that's two aspects of the way science and technology evolution work with or against each other. And uh, we'll see how it plays out in the future. You just hope that there are enough people building real things and figuring the stuff out for themselves that they keep ahead of the fundamental scientists who want to write enough equation to slow them down. <laughs> well, that was uh, great, Carver, and really interesting, um, your points on how science or fundamental things uh, need to connect to the real world uh, to make progress. And uh, it's the first time, though, I've heard that uh, you're, you're a little shy on it, but the, uh, Carver really coined Moore's Law, and it's the first time that I've heard that Moore's Law triumphed Murphy's Law. <laughs> so uh, I intend to use that again. The, um, so it's my, uh, I want to introduce George um, before I basically turn it over to the two of them to have a dialogue. And I think many of you, you know that uh, George and Bruce Chapman and I first actually met at, in college. And sometimes I think all three of us think the best thing we got out of that little school back in Cambridge was that we met each other and got more out of each other sometimes than, than our classes. But uh, Bruce was from Chicago, I was from Seattle, and George was from uh, Western Massachusetts. So it was uh, great that we got together. So George, I think almost, I'm sure everybody here knows uh, George's history. Um, he's been a leading expert and futurist on technology and economics. His two uh, most recent books are terrific. He's written a number of books over the years, uh, Knowledge and Power. Um, I was talking to Chuck Barbell. We were both talking about how much we valued that book. Um, and now, Scandal of Money. And uh, uh, very um, innovative, insightful things, actually, not very many other people are saying, and, and very much on. George, also, the connection to Carver, in part, is that 
George wrote at least two books about Carver, uh, or Carver's work. One was called Microcosm, which was really the CMOS chip development, and uh, Revolution, and Silicon Eye on a Fovian sensor, which uh, went into uh, cameras. Um, so I thought I might lead it off with uh, kind of picking up a little bit with what Carver said. I'll start with a question really to George, and then you guys can carry it on how you'd like. Um, which is really, um, George had a debate um, some time ago with Peter Thiel, who's been in the news the last few days, um, but on a different subject, which was really, Peter Thiel was taking the position, basically everything important has sort of been invented, and we're now just, um, you know, applying some of these technologies. And I think, you know, I think it's interesting, Carver's sort of take on that, that there's a lot of work always on the technologies that's really some pretty fundamental science. But George, where do you, I mean, let's turn it to where we are today. Where do you, where do you think we're, are we kind of just all, our job now is to apply some great things that have been invented over the last 20 years, or? Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> you know, I, I always uh, say that uh, Peter Thiel really won the debate because uh, although he previously seemed to endorse uh, Cowan, a uh, Tyler Cowan's proposition that that something fundamental in the technology had uh, reached its limits and uh, uh, spontaneous tunneling was going on and causing a general kind of a degeneration. But uh, Teal's real argument is about regulation. I mean, Teal believes that. Uh, our whole system is becoming so encrusted with webs of uh, regulatory intervention and, and arbitrary uh, action that, that it's very hard to launch any major new technology today. It's not that it's intrinsically impossible to conceive and develop a major new technology, but it's very difficult to launch one. I, I've just had that experience myself with a company called Selvin Laboratories, which uh, used carbon nanotubes in a filter, water filter, that could eliminate viruses and bacteria without uh, any external chemicals or power. It was because uh, gravity fit feed. And uh, th this technology was, was worked well in Afghanistan and Iraq, but when we tried to introduce it to the United States um, to have, uh, have it used in homes and, and in uh, s kitchen sinks and whatever, the EPA ruled that carbon nanotubes uh, resembled asbestos and posed a threat of cancer. And uh, the arguments that they made would, would totally prohibit uh, the use of any fireplace, which is full of carbon in every form of nano uh, configuration, and uh, more open to uh, babies sucking up the ashes than uh, filter under a sink, but uh, nonetheless, the EPA in its wisdom did decide that uh, if there was any possibility that any nanotube would ever enter a water flow, that uh, they had to be stopped. So, so they, st they closed down this company. And you may remember that if, we met, if we'd given this uh, session 20 years ago, after Smalley, and the team at Rice developed carbon nanotubes. They were regarded as the single most promising new technology that had emerged from um, U.S. science. And, uh, and uh, Steve Forbes became a leading exponent of it, and nanotech was going to transform the world, and then Drexler up at MIT uh, wanted to use uh, nanotech in various mechanical ways, which I thought was mi were misconceived and delusional. But nonetheless, n nanotubes uh, and nanotechnology became a 
a great hope for America. And uh, today, uh, the EPA is trying to stop it, uh, just as they're trying to stop uh, most of new technologies. And Teal's absolutely correct insight is that is that the problems of the U.S. economy, economy today, the sluggishness and stagnation, springs from this Luddite suppression of new technology that's uh, underway all across the country, but reaches its pinnacle at the EPA. And, uh, but, um, uh, Carter, you, uh, when you, the tunneling, the tunnel di uh, the uh, laser interferometer, uh, interferometry, is now finding new uses. And uh, you've been intimately involved in research related to the use of laser interferometry to uh, identify gravity waves. And, and I'd be fascinated with a report of, you have some of your students involved in this effort. And uh, what have you discovered? Uh, this, there, there have been amazing announcements made. Einstein has apparently been vindicated, and uh, there are various other uh, claims being made. What's your judgment of this venture? Well, I am. Um, hello? Yeah, hold uh, hello? Yeah, there we go. Um, it's true that um, the gravitational coupling of the same the same coupling that makes the Earth go around the sun <coughs> also couples um, any massive object with all other massive objects in the universe. It's a universal coupling and it goes like one over the distance. Well, the amount of matter in the universe goes like the square of the distance from us. So. That means that we're actually experience coupling to matter far away much more than we experience coupling to matter close. So if you just think that through a little bit, that means that if some piece of matter is shaking violently somewhere in the universe, it's shaking everything else that it's coupled to. Now, of course, if it's very far away, it won't shake things far here very much, but it will do some. And if it's closer, it will shake things here more. So my friend Kip Thorne and, and his co-workers about 40 years ago started down this path of using very large laser interferometers to try to detect gravitational waves. And that's what I just discovered. What I just described was what are called gravitational waves. It's just the coupling of matter here to everything else out there by the gravitational coupling. And so it was expected long before Einstein, that there would be, this coupling would allow gravitational radiation to be sensed. But whenever anybody calculated how big it was by any kind of theory, it turned out that it would be very weak, extremely weak. Um, so the devices that were going to detect it would have to be far more sensitive than anything ever built by the human race. Um, right now there's a observatory in Hanford, Washington, which you already know, the, and one down in Livingston, Louisiana, that are coupled with each other uh, electronically. and. They are both sensitive to about, they have mirrors on a four kilometer interferometers. At four kilometers apart, there's mirrors about this big around. 
that are hung on very thin fibers so that if a gravitational coupling were to happen, they would move a little bit. And the one on one end would move a little bit before the one on the other end because the gravitational wave is traveling at the speed of light. And that would cause a little difference in the distance between the mirrors, which would then show up as an interference pattern. Uh, those instruments have been evolved now for 25 or 30 years, and they just got refitted about a, uh, in the last few years. They were taken down and, and refitted to make them several times more sensitive than they'd ever been before. Uh, the uh, people I work with there, uh, uh, we, were, we were actually not looking for the kind of signal that has been discovered. We were looking for signals from pulsars because uh, pulsar goes around and beeps and you, ha you know how fast it's going around. And there are some that are reasonably close to us, and we, we reasoned that probably we could hear, we could sense a signal from a rotating pulsar uh, before we could sense anything else. We were wrong. We, we bet on the wrong horse. Uh, it turned out that uh, when you have violent events, uh, like you have two massive bodies that are in orbit around each other, and they gradually lose energy due to this coupling with the rest of the universe that we talked about, the gravitational coupling. And finally, they lose enough energy that they merge. And in the process, you know, it's like water in the bathtub. The closer they get, the faster they go around each other. And so there's a big burst of gravitational coupling to everything out there. And the frequency goes up in a very characteristic way. And just last September, the uh, instruments, both at Hanford and uh, Livingston, Louisiana, were being tested. They weren't even in science mode yet. They were just being checked out. But they sensed a signal. It was a bigger signal than anything that we expected. And uh, in fact, um, what we've done is we've, uh, we have, of course, the data from that signal. It's been filtered to take out the known noise, which, you know, is everywhere. And um, it's been shifted up in frequency so that it's in the range of human hearing. But otherwise, it's the real signal. And what we've done is we've repeated it. There's one signal was sensed at the Louisiana uh, instrument seven milliseconds before the one that was sensed in Hanford. And that tells you that it's 30 degrees or so up above the line that connects those two instruments just from the delay of the speed of light there. Well, we've got, uh, what you'll hear is, in, in one loudspeaker you'll hear Louisiana, and the other loudspeaker you'll hear Hanford, Washington. And we've changed the delay a little bit and played it over and over, so you should hear it marching across. Uh, Mike, could we have the... Everybody get that? How about one more time, Mike? Uh, now that's not that's not made up. That's the real signal. It was way above the noise, and it's exactly what you'd expect from two very massive objects coming together. Now I mentioned that that was actually frequency was shifted up, so it's in the range of human hearing. It was actually started out around 50 hertz and came up to about 200. So if you listen to it. The way it really came, it just sort of sounds like a thud. So it's, it's, you can 
use your ear much better this way. But that frequency that you hear <coughs> actually tells us a lot about what the, device, uh, the massive objects were. And uh, any theory, uh, not just Einstein's theory, um, gives you a relationship between the masses of the objects and the frequency that happens when they merge. And I've worked it out with my own approach to gravitation, and I get more or less the same answer they do. And it's rather remarkable. The, uh, the masses of the objects involved are about 30 times the mass of our sun. So they're big things. Uh, by that time, um, they're no longer a neutron star, they're a black hole. And there's a lot of argument about exactly the details of the black hole. Uh, I get a different conclusion about what's inside than the general relativity people do, but, it, but we more or less agree that these are amazing objects that have swallowed a lot of matter. And uh, something really remarkable happened when they, when they joined. This is a historic event. Um, it's probably once in a lifetime that you get a really new window on the universe. And this is a new window on the universe. And these device, these objects that we heard merging are objects that we've only speculated about. We have no other direct information about them. This is the first time we have quantitative measurement of a device that's way beyond anything that we've been able to see uh, before by any electromagnetic signal or anything like that. So it's a very historic time. And there will be a lot more of these sightings. We'll learn a lot about the universe, and we'll learn a lot about gravitation. And gravitation um, is a, still to this day a little explored aspect of nature. Now you think, well, it's what holds us to the Earth. What's so, what's so mysterious about that? Well, the, the energies involved in holding you to the Earth and in, in the Earth going around the Sun are minuscule compared with the atomic energy stored in all the atoms in the Earth. But we see in objects like this that the energy that got liberated in gravitational waves was like tens of percent of the nuclear energy in the object. It's like <coughs> far more than it's re as a fraction that is released by an atomic explosion. So this is this is big stuff. This is this is testing our understanding, not just of gravitation, but of all kinds of physics, way, way past where we've been before. So it's an exciting time. And now the theories are really going to get put to the test. And this is the first time. All the other experiments we have on gravitation are basically very weak compared with the nuclear energies in the, and this one's not. And we'll see a lot more that aren't. So this is an exciting time. How does Mack's principle relate to this discovery? It's, uh, uh, you've been talking to me about Mack's principle for 20 years uh, or more. And uh, I gather that this in some way, uh, what, what is the, the role of Mach's principle, which Einstein cited uh, in uh, the shaping of this test and in, in underlying the assumptions that you described uh, about the uh, size of masses and 
distances. Uh, yeah, I, I should explain what um, Ernst Mach was a, uh, the guy at the, the Mach number is named after an uh, yep. amazing scientist who came before Einstein. Mm -hmm. Mach is, you know, the uh, speed of yep. breaking the sound barrier is Mach's yeah. And uh, he, he uh, was very unhappy with, with Newton's idea that somehow there's an absolute space out there. He said, no. If a thing is moving, it has to be moving with respect to something. And the only thing you have is the rest of the universe. So if you're moving, you're moving with respect to the rest of the universe. And once that's said, it seems quite obvious. But it's never been made to work, theoretically. And uh, Einstein tried very hard, and at the end of his <laughs> life was quite disappointed that his general relativity did not really embody that principle. That according to that principle, if you have an object here that has inertia, it's hard to accelerate it. That inertia comes from the coupling, that gravitational coupling, to all the rest of the matter in the universe. It's a big idea. It's an important idea. I happen to believe it's true. Um, I had my own cut at, at making an approach that works. It turns out you can do it. Mine is sort of a rough cut. It's not as mathematically polished as, as general relativity is after a hundred years of some of the smartest people in the world that have worked on it. But it seems to me it has to be true. And when you take that position, then things like the gravitational radiation are just an aspect of our local frame of reference for objects that is set by everything else out in the universe. And if something wiggles out there, our frame of reference just wiggles a little tiny bit. And just to, to calibrate you, this signal that we heard, the distance between the mirrors changed by about one part in 10 with 20 zeros after it. So, that's how sensitive these, these instruments are. But it's the first time, it's really the first time we've had our hands on this kind of, of connection with the rest of the universe. And, and I, I confidently predict that in the next 20 years or so, we're going to, we're going to see a, a complete change in our, the way we view the physical world. Because our whole theory has grown up by doing what we call isolated experiments. And the belief was that uh, physical objects have a, a properties that are inherent to those objects, like their inertia and their charge and all of those things. And so if you could isolate it from all everything else in the rest of the universe, then you could make precise measurements. And that belief has basically been the pillar upon which modern observational experimental science has been built. And it's been fantastically successful. But you know, there's an old, old principle that you've all seen at work. The thing that made you successful in the past is the thing that's going to keep you from going forward into the future. And it always happens. And that's happening right now today. That's Clayton Christian's principle. <laughs> Clayton Christensen's oh, yes. principle. Uh, Clayton it, didn't invent it. Uh, he did not invent <laughs> it. But he no. quotes it a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We want to take some questions from the audience. Do you have a mic or something that we can, or maybe we'll just repeat the questions. Yeah. Take the mic. 
Well, I've got uh, two questions, sorry to say, but the popular press uh, Sky and Telescope had that the energy that created these gravitational waves amounted to the total dissipation of three solar units within a matter of milliseconds. So that that's some perspective. The other is George, in his book, Microcosm, called you the prophet. And from George, I have learned that the people we call prophets are people like George, who look around and see what they see. They tell other people, write it, and they write it up. Other people look around and they say, it's come true, he's a prophet. What's your experience in that realm, and how did you think of George when he entitled that chapter, The Prophet? Uh, uh, you've just made it a, a profound and uh, revolutionary prophecy. I mean, you've declared that all our current science is going to be affected by this transition from the effort to create the isolated experiment to uh, a science that based on Mach's principle or that uh, recognizes that no experiment can be isolated. And uh, what, what, what will this do to us? What, what happens when, it, but you, at the, on the other hand, you tell us that uh, this existing principle has been phenomenally successful in uh, producing the technologies that we have achieved. Uh, what, uh, how would uh, this transition manifest itself? I mean, how, what kinds of technologies would it undermine or, or ultimately thwart? Uh, d does it affect our ability to explore the universe? Does it affect our, uh, the idea of multiple parallel universes? That most, uh, uh, lots of physicists believe that this is was just one universe among infinite parallel universes. So anything that happens to happen in our universe might be um, reversed in some other universe. And maybe we could couple to the, all these other universes have to be part of this model. But I, I, what, what does this, does this discovery have any significance about multiple parallel universes, which I think is one of the most destructive sort of uh, scientific propositions I've ever heard introduced? I mean, it's, it's a true trahison of the clerks, you know, the scientists declaring the utter insignificance of their work. Uh, but does this discovery of gravitational waves or, or measurement of them or does it, does it does it relate to the question of whether there are infinite multiple universes? Um, there's really a lot of questions there. <laughs> <laughs> um, George is good at, at asking lots of questions in one sentence. Um, the First of all, let me talk about the, the multiple universes. Um, I've tried to be polite, but let me be a little more direct. Um, science, in the late 1800s, there was a widespread belief in science that everything important had been discovered, that all the laws of nature were known, and uh, there was a guy by the name of Max Planck who the Planck constants named after. He's the man that really started the quantum revolution with his work. And he went to his advisor when he was a grad student and said he wanted to work on electromagnetism. And the advisor kind of frowned and he said, well, you know, everything's known about electromagnetism. Uh, you, you might get you know, one more decimal place on some of the measurements. And Planck, being a very deeply thinking person, said, well, 
He just wanted to understand it all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that, he discovered there was a thing that just didn't work. And at one point he said he was willing to give up everything he knew about physics because it just didn't work. And then he hit on the idea that there were these discrete energy levels in the interaction of light with matter. And that started the whole idea of the quantum revolution. Um, well, so you see what happens when people get too full of themselves. Anytime you hear people going around like they are today, congratulating themselves how they have these theories that, that predict all these things. And aren't we so smart? Well, let me tell you how smart we are. We have a prevailing theory, a quantum theory, which I talked a little bit about. It's really a huge kludge, but everybody seems to be going down the same path like a bunch of lemmings. And we have a theory that of gravitation, Einstein's general relativity. And everybody's going down that path. When you take the quantum theory as it exists today and try to join it with a analysis of the universe based on general relativity, or, in, by the way, any other theory of gravitation, you find that they are off by 10 with 120 zeros. <laughs> there has never been a larger disconnect in the history of science than we have today. And what do we have? We have people writing books like The End of Science. We know it all. No. There is a, down at the bottom, it's rotten. And we keep putting band-aids over it. And I've heard, not too far from here, a learned talk about these two theories and how great they are. Never mention the fact that if you try to analyze a universe with both of those things, they're off by that many zeros. It's incredible how the scientific establishment is hiding its head in the sand. So my own take is we're on the verge of another scientific revolution that's just as big as the one that happened 120 years ago. And nobody's seeing it, just like nobody was seeing it back then. And to George's question, will the observation of gravitational waves and the general growing awareness that we live in a universe that we're coupled to in numerous ways and that we can't any longer think of local properties of matter as being isolated from the cosmology of the universe as a whole. Uh, will that awareness come through gravitational waves? Will it come through a new technology revolution? I don't know where it'll come. But we have to rethink the whole thing. I'm doing the best I can to rethink it my own way. I have many friends that are keenly uncomfortable with the mess we've got ourselves in. Um, what troubles me the most, quite frankly, is that I have never seen any course where we teach our undergraduates about these problems with the current theory. People teach that material as if it was true, when it can't possibly be true. 
So that has to change. Science is about being honest. I need a microphone. There's a yeah. question back here, oh. and then we'll okay. the next one. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the Federal Communications Commission <laughs> recently decided to regulate broadband like a public utility under Title II of the 1934 Communications Act. Looking back, for example, to when fiber optics became available for use in the telephone system beginning in the 1970s, and the received wisdom was that we had the best communications capacity in the world. How well did the telecom industry do under Title II in terms of supplying the bandwidth that computers were ready to exploit? Well, I, I always, uh, I had the debate. I, I propounded something called Gilder's Law that didn't turn out as well as Moore's Law. <laughs> um, and I had to debate uh, Andy Grove, who was, and, uh, who was an old friend of Carver's, and Les Vidas, his uh, Hungarian sidekick. And, uh, and um, Grove's law was that uh, bandwidth expands a hundred times slower than our ability to use it. And, uh, and I have to admit that, uh, uh, that this was true, that bandwidth for many years just failed to expand in proportion to the capabilities of the technology that was emerging from Carver's labs. And I uh, had my alibi for this development. I called it Moron's Law. <laughs> and, and, that was, uh, and that was the law embodied in this, these myriad regulations that tried to uh, regulate the development of rapidly changing technologies in a static form. And, and uh, this, and uh, the res Gilder's Law did work to technologically. The, the power of this uh, uh, technology, fiber optics, and uh, as it turned out, more importantly, um, wireless technology, this electromagnetic technology uh, had capabilities and that uh, turned out to be hugely greater than anticipated. It, it turned out that contrary to what most people believed, uh, uh, wireless technology was not restricted to single big antennas with uh, vast coverage that you could multiply the antennas as uh, widely as you wanted. Uh, you could create actual uh, micro cells and pico cells and each of these cells could accommodate as, as uh, much information as uh, great citywide cells of the past. And, and wireless really did fulfill much of the promise that, uh, uh, that fiber optics offered. And uh, t today they are converging, and, uh, but huge uh, changes are underway. And the idea of nat nationalizing and neutralizing the internet at this point seems to me to be uh, just uh, outrageous. I mean, it, this, it may be the single worst uh, uh, Obama policy is uh, nationalizing the internet and trying to neutralize, which is price impose price controls at every node across an ever proliferating communications facility. And, and so, uh, but uh, for years, uh, the telcos were chiefly, were famously dominated by lawyers and accountants. And uh, they were chiefly trying to figure out how to manipulate the rules uh, in a way that would allow them to extend their uh, services at some slow incremental uh, rate. Hi, I, uh, I would just like to ask this. 
I, I try to read what I can understand as broadly as I can, especially in the area that you were speaking about, cosmology. And uh, uh, I have a totally different impression. I just like your reaction to this from everything I read by the respected physicists and cosmologists out there. I don't have to list them. I think you would agree with them if I started Brian down Gray. that list. Uh, well, there's one, but there's many. Uh, Lee, uh, you know, Smolin and Lawrence Krauss and others. And I've never read anywhere in any of these books that the, any of these guys think we have the answers, that it's understood. The biggest embarrassment in physics readily acknowledged by all these fellows is this vacuum energy disparity between what we see for a a flat universe and what we would calculate that that energy ha has to be. So I think you're being just a little bit un unfair to that community. The, the, and the one, one thing I think most of them will agree on, and we're a long way from it yet, but any reasonable theory has to be falsifiable. Otherwise, it borders on philosophy and religion. And we're a long way from that. Dark matter, dark energy, quantum entanglement entanglement, non-locality, you know, the list goes on. So don't you think you're maybe being just a little hard on these guys? I think it's readily acknowledged that we're in a mess right now, but it's not hopeless. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one thing that is agreed by everyone is that we don't know what dark energy is. We don't even know what dark matter is. Um, that wasn't what I was talking about. That's only 75% of the stuff out there. I'm talking about the, the 120 orders of magnitude disconnect that doesn't get talked about. Everybody talks about the 75% stuff that we don't know what it is. By the way, I, I've, you know, I've done my own sort of amateur cosmology using my own approach and um, my take on it is that the, that 75 percent of dark energy stuff is an artifact of general relativity and I don't I don't have it necessary in my approach to cosmology it it isn't required okay. so it's a it's a peculiarity of the of the theory of gravitation is being used, and uh, which, by the way, I don't think will be the the surviving theory of gravitation. Uh, I think that's one of the things that has to to turn over. And um, I think the the question you're raising is a very good one. That everybody agrees to that. But they don't all talk about the 120 orders of magnitude. And that's a far more serious problem. That, by the way, is not a problem with the gravitation side. It's a problem with the quantum side. And it, it, it's extremely deeply embedded in the way the quantum stuff is formulated and the way it's taught. You don't have to do that. You can do, you can analyze all the quantum systems without that. I, I should explain a little bit what it is. The, the idea that was put forward by Heisenberg and Bohr was that, that light were these little bundles, that the, the quantization, the fact that it's a thing, is an inherent property of light, not a property of the interaction of light with matter. Planck thought otherwise. Planck thought it was the property of the interaction of light with matter, as I, as I, th as I do. Um, the theory got carried by Heisenberg and Bohr, and now it's taught as if it's gospel that Light is little bullets, and it simply can't be true. There's all kinds of things wrong with it, as I mentioned just a few. But the biggest thing wrong with it is 
that if that were true, then those little fluctuations in those little degrees of freedom of the radiation field, as they say, would have energy in them, and that energy would gravitate, and there would be vastly more than is observed in the universe by any theory. By these huge number of powers of 10. So it's a non-starter. We basically have to go back to square one. It isn't hard to do. It's just there's enormous edifice built on this rotten foundation of concept. It's just wrong, that's all. And you mentioned the multiple universes. There's this thing about when a quantum system decides to go this way or that way, what happens? What made it do that? And what have? Well, one way out of that is to say, oh, well, in one universe it went one way and the other universe it went the other way. <laughs> but that happens every time light is absorbed by an atom. That's insane. Mm. It's totally insane. It doesn't have many followers either. Um, it has lots of followers, including Krauss. Yes. It, it's, it's, it's nuts that we can have I've a, a, a thing which is just a non-starter that doesn't get talked about. And yet, you popularize multiple universes. Mm. I mean, this is a mess right now. Mm. And, Green too. and yet, when you hear people talk, oh, everyone agrees to this. We know all of them. We have to start a lot of this over again to get it straightened yeah. out. Maybe the problem's in academia, because the popular books on this don't take that position. Yeah. Well, Kaki and uh, uh, there's a whole series of popular books by Brian Greene and uh, Michiko Kaki and all these uh, figures who uh, s celebrate m uh, multiple parallel universes. I've read the books, uh, <laughs> and uh, they they and they speak of multiple technologies emerging from them. But I'd like to. Um, offer a prophecy before I go home tonight <laughs> since since I've been depicted as a prophet and uh, I pretty, my first prophecy is that uh, Carver will be vindicated on uh, his uh, insights into gravitation my second proposition is that um, uh, if uh, there's only one universe it is a singularity it is a unique universe and uh, one of the most fascinating and best books I've read about this universe is by Michael Denton, who is a fellow at Discovery. And it's called Nature's Destiny. And uh, he sh shows with uh, uh, enormous encyclopedic range covering chemistry, physics, cosmology, biology, and uh, really focusing on biology because he's an eminent biologist that uh, that uh, this unique universe really is in uh, uh, enormous numbers of ways is perfectly contrived to accommodate human consciousness and uh, that this is really the ultimate triumph of this unique singular universe we occupy and if this is true uh, uh, I conclude that uh, the technology world, ever since Carver began uh, exploring the tunnel diode as the first quantum uh, function that had been uh, uncovered in electronics, uh, and embarked after that on the creation of silicon intelligence, uh, that uh, this was a wrong path 
and uh, that uh, the next era is going to be the triumph of carbon intelligence. And these carbon nanotubes and uh, graphene devices, which uh, have all sorts of function, uh, functions that uh, far uh, surpass uh, silicon properties. And uh, carbon itself as an element uh, is associated with 250,000 uh, different uh, forms that uh, vastly excel in their robustness and, and capabilities, the uh, more limited repertory of silicon, that it's going to turn out that uh, to have truly intelligent machines, it's going to have to be carbon, and uh, that uh, the next technology successes in uh, artificial intelligence or whatever will not be silicon, but, but carbon. We're moving into a carbon era. And actually, the, uh, there's, a, there's a precursor to that that's already happened uh, right here in, uh, in uh, Seattle. Uh, there's a fellow over at the UW by the name of Larry Dalton who has created uh, nonlinear optical materials, carbon-based mm -hmm. nonlinear optical materials that are orders of magnitude more effective than any of the precursor materials. And it's totally transformed the interaction of electronics with light. So it's already happening, George. Okay. <laughs> Bring on the EPA. <laughs> I think with that, we'll, uh, with that we'll, that's a good conclusion and leaves open a whole bunch of questions. So that's great. Thank you both. Thank you, the audience. Steve, do you want to?